Okay, let's begin this evening, 644. 644 in your hymnals. We'll start by singing Springs of Living Water. 644, good to see everybody. Looking forward to the Bible study tonight. What the Lord has put on Pastor Benton's heart. Let's all stand and sing together, everybody. No one left out, 644. I thirsted in the barren land of sin and shame, and nothing satisfying there I found. But to the blessed cross of Christ one day I came, where springs of living water did abound. Drinking at the springs of Shouting hallelujah every day. Drinking at the springs of living water. Happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water. Oh, wonderful and bountiful supply. Oh, sinner, won't you come to Savior now invites you to the water free, where thirsting spirits can be satisfied. Drinking at the springs of living water, happy now am I, my soul they satisfy. Drinking at the springs of living water, oh wonderful and bountiful supply. Man, I'm glad that they continue to supply, and we've had a great day today. It's been a busy week already. I hope you've had a good week. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it in just a minute, but let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer and ask for his blessings this evening on us, all right? Father, thank you for the beautiful day you bless us with and the health to be here today. I know there are those that would like to be here but can't be, and I pray that you'll just bless them and help them tonight. I pray that you'll just bless uh, the things that we do tonight. May it bring honor and glory to you. And our fellowship, Lord, we thank you for that time we can get together with other Christians and just be able to uh, be able to talk again, be able to just have a, a discussion about what the Lord's doing in our lives. And I pray that you'll just bless it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I just want to say thank you for being here tonight and welcome. Um, uh, we had a birthday today for Jacob, and, uh, and so that was, it's been a big day for him. He turned eight today. And we are in the season of birthdays. We start having them back in February, and we don't quit until July. And they just we just look from one to the next. And uh, and who's next? I don't know. Who, who's next? The baby? Oh, that's right. The baby's next. Okay, and then Arabeth. Um, and so uh, we we've had a good day though. It's been a lot of fun. And so you be you be. Uh, you can say happy birthday to Jacob. Uh, he hadn't got his birthday whooping yet. We're hoping he don't earn it by the end of the day. How many of you used to get a birthday whooping? I mean, every yeah, well, yeah I, I used to really get one. Um, I think it quit somewhere around 25 or something like that. But, um, but no, we, we had a good day, and so you can wish him happy birthday. I hope you, you've had a good one. Um, we'll tell you in just a few minutes a little bit about What's going on? We had a good visit with the doctor this week, uh, my wife and I, and so I didn't go in, but she went in, and uh, and we'll tell you more about that in just a few minutes. A lot of prayer requests tonight, so I'm going to try to try not to be too long in preaching tonight and, and spend some time in prayer. All right, so Brother Dan, you come on up and lead us another song. 641, 641, we'll sing again, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus 641 and stay seated while we sing please who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine true and tender pure and precious oh, 
oh, how blessed to call him mine. Oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. Love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. Oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. And verse 4 as the last together. Every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see. On his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me, and the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. All right. Tonight is everybody give something night, right? Men, uh, ushers, if you'll grab these offering plates, we're going to take up an offering tonight just for those people that are uh, going off to college and and um, they're they're going off to college. I, wait, I've got to give you one. I forgot last time. I'm going to have to make sure I put something in there, okay? If you got a dime, put it in, okay? If you got $10, okay, that's fine too. But they're going to go ahead and, and go back here in just a moment. We're going to pray for it. And, um, and these guys that are off to Christian college, they're poor. Okay, help them folks out, all right? They need all the help they can get. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing, and then uh, we'll take up an offering tonight for those folks. Lord, thank you so much for giving us and what we need throughout the week, and I pray to just bless this offering and bless those students that are away tonight where we think of them. I know some of them are homesick. Some of them are uh, working hard at their studies and trying to um, glorify you with the work that they put into it. I pray that they do just that. And you would use them, Lord, for a good thing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Miss Connie. I appreciate that. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter number 3 tonight. Genesis chapter number 3. And uh, I've been talking to Brother Dan, and we're going to tag team a lesson a little bit. I'm going to have him uh, preach not next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, because I'm probably not going to be here, and because I asked him to because uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the topic of music and, and praising the Lord, worshiping the Lord, and, and holiness and things of that nature. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, it's very it's very interesting study. It takes a, you can spend as much time as you want on it because it's so deep. But, um, so I'm going to, because of obviously his gift of music, um, I'm going to allow, allow him to do a Wednesday night, and I know we'll be looking forward to that. But I probably won't be here. I'll have to watch it. 
uh, later on. Uh, the, the reason is, you know, it's getting really close to baby time, all right? And so uh, we're trying to plan for that, and the doctor's trying to help us plan for that. And so we'll, we'll tell you as time goes on uh, how much closer that gets. But she's moving farther and farther along with each week, as we're finding out. Each time we go to the doctor, she's a little closer. All right, so you just keep praying for her and the safety of the baby. But they did a little stress test the other day, and everything was great with the baby. Uh, no, a non-stress test, excuse me, which I don't understand why they can call it that. They just uh, call it a test. But anyway, so it's not a stressful test. But anyway, that's fine. The baby's great, and so mama's great. Uh, she's tired of being that far along, I guess, but, uh, you know, as anybody would be. She's, it's frustrating at times, but uh, so you just keep praying for them. She's been super throughout this whole process, and, and I'm, glad I, I'm glad I got her. But uh, tonight, I want to start off with talking a little bit about what I said last Sunday night was the, the great deception, the great deception. Um, the truth of the matter is we live in a world today that's ruled by a prince. And this is a prince that wants to destroy. He wants to destroy my life, your life, our family's life, our country. He wants to destroy the freedoms we have. Um, and he's at work. And sometimes we tend to think of him as kind of being on the outside. You know, he wouldn't bother me. You know, he's got other fig, uh, fish to fry, you know, bigger fish. But, uh, and perhaps so. He's not, uh, in the, the way that God is, he's not omniscient and he's not omnipotent and he's not omnipresent. And so he can't be everywhere uh, at the same time. And so most likely, you know, where is he now? I don't know. He could be at, in Washington. I mean, it's possible. I don't know. It's possible. He could be anywhere. He could be anywhere. We don't know. The Bible tells us he's like a roaring lion walking to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He's looking to, to hurt us. He really is. Not only that, but when he fell from heaven, um, he pulled with him many demons, many other fallen angels who were at his bidding. And so uh, that's a possibility as well. And I want us to talk a little bit about the doctrine of our adversary, the devil, uh, before we get into this topic about music. Now, I love music, love it. And uh, even now, I have a really large selection of, I don't have a large selection, I have a large swath of likes of music from bluegrass, gospel, and just bluegrass all the way to opera. Now, I don't like all of any of it. Okay, don't get me wrong, because you look at me a little weird when I say opera, okay? But, but I know, I, I know, because, you know, that may not be too popular. But there is a, a taste of it once in a while I, I kind of like. If, um, if you're interested in, like, the most beautiful one I can possibly think of, go look up the flower duet, and um, it will, it, you'll just, it'll knock your socks off. It's gorgeous. It's not very long, okay? And, and they're not too overbearing. It's pretty. All right, so. But y'all, and then you go all the way down to I like hearing somebody pick something on a mandolin pretty good myself. Okay, I can get into the Beverly Hillbilly song even. I even, I even like that once in a while. Okay, but anyway, and everything in between. But um, I grew up, you know, uh, listening to whatever my parents listened to, my brother listened to, and but and in this series here is not to try to pull you away from one genre of music into another genre of music or anything like that or even call out specific ones. Now, we use a term, we'll use the term rock music just because it's so broad, okay? I'll probably just say that because it's so broad. But I'm going to talk about how the devil can use music in our lives to, to hurt us. But also what God's plan for music is in our lives, how we make those wise choices. Because you and I are making choices all the time that benefit us, our children, our families as a whole, and, of course, I'm responsible for our church, too. And so uh, I like to take a look then at Genesis chapter 3. Follow along with me. We're going to pray at the end of the service tonight, okay? Genesis chapter 3. And I want us to see something uh, going right back to the very beginning here and looking at uh, the way that the devil works. And uh, he's, he's a pretty slick fellow. Let's start at the very beginning of the chapter. It says, now the serpent, he was used by the devil, okay, the serpent, 
was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the true fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be made uh, to, excuse me, to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they saw that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now, I, I really like this chapter. Not, I don't like the outcome of this chapter, but I like this chapter because it just tells us so much uh, about doctrine that we can use for the rest of the Bible. But to begin with, I want us to understand a couple of things that it says in the very beginning. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. What does that mean? Well, it means he was slick, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that he was slimy slick, all right? He had not been cursed yet. Um, there was a curse on him after the fact that caused him to have to crawl on his belly and eat the dust of the earth for the rest of his life. But that has not happened yet. When we think of a serpent, when we think of a, well, we think of a snake, right? And we think of a, a, a gross-looking um, I mean, there's a certain beauty to them, I guess. To some people, I still don't like to hold them in my hand. Um, I, I one time, we, uh, I don't know if it was me or my dad, but I've, I've shot several at, in my house in North Carolina. We had a creek below it, and there was several water moccasins around, and we had to be on the lookout. And, and so whenever there was one, we, I had permission. I was probably eight. 9, 10, I don't know. But I had permission, if I did see one, to get my shotgun and go back down there and shoot them. And so uh, one day, me and my dad, or me, I don't know, we shot one. And it rolled over belly up in the water there. And I grabbed a stick and I pulled that thing over to me. And it was a thick, thick old thing, a little fat thing. And uh, I pulled that thing over, and about this long. And we put its head on a rock and took a pocket knife and cut its head off. And, uh, and it was, I mean, it was knocked unconscious. There wasn't anything wrong with it unless its back broke or something like that. I think it was just the pressure of the gun going right, that bullet going by and just like knocked him unconscious or something. And so we cut his head off right there. Well, I thought that was cool. I decided to pick him up because you know what happens to animals when you kill them? The nerves are still at work. And they do some cool things, right? And that thing's still moving. And I grabbed it, and I pulled that thing up, and it started moving. And I'm telling you, that's one of the eeriest feelings, the grossest feelings. It didn't even have a head, and I was afraid it was going to bite me. And, and it, on top of that, it was a poisonous snake, and it just made it that much worse. On top of that, I think I was holding its stomach, and I could feel a frog in there. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I couldn't hold on to it very long. I had to let that thing go. I mean, it just, oh, it creeped me out. Now, some of you might be like, nah, don't bother me. You know, you, you snake handler. You're weird people. Okay, so uh, whatever. Um, and I'm never going to be a snake handling church kind of person. Okay, it just ain't going to happen. I don't know about those people. But anyhow, so, yeah, I don't, I don't look at snakes today and think they're real. I mean, there's some beauty to the colors of them. It's amazing how they move, right? I mean, the way they're made. I mean, God's creation is just amazing. But before the fall, before... Satan had done that and God cursed him. He wasn't on his belly. I don't understand what he looked like. I have no idea. I can't even comprehend it. Okay. <laughs> Some people have had these little drawings of a uh, this lizard, you know, on back feet and little hands or something like that. And I, I don't know about all that. I think that's a little far-fetched. But we know this, though. Most likely, most likely, it was a very attractive animal. Okay. Most likely it was a very attractive animal because when it came up to Eve, she wasn't bothered by it, didn't bother her at all. She would just sit there and listen to it and talk to it, okay? Um, being subtle means he was slick and he was smooth, but it didn't 
it could have meant his graceful movement, and a snake has graceful movement. It could have meant that. But more than anything, it has to do with the way he conducted himself. He would have been a really good lawyer. And I don't mean that bad for lawyers, okay? But lawyers are good at talking, aren't they? They're good at sharing their side of the story and making their side convincing, right? I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. They're paid to do that, all right? A lot of them, if they were saved, would be really good preachers. Okay, so anyway, well, they are very, they're, he would have been real skillful in the way he talked. We don't know exactly everything that was said. This might be everything that was said. There might have been more in between the lines that we don't know about. But nevertheless, he was a real slick guy. And he was very convincing, and he was easy to talk to. Now, to our demise, men, we don't, we're not good talkers. We don't like to talk. You don't believe me? Just ask your wife. She knows whether you're a good talker or not. Matter of fact, she, most of the time she's asking. Remember the last time I said, they'll say, what are you thinking? And you'll go, honestly, honey, I'm sorry. There was nothing going on there. I'm sorry. Um, and, but, but if you ask her, and I've done this, I can see my wife's thinking about it. I've asked her, what are you thinking? And, it's, and a smile comes over, and she's like, she, she rattles off all kinds of things. I mean, it's just, she's just really thinking. She's multitasking thinking, not just tasking doing. And so they like to talk about what they're doing. And man, do they talk. And she has a friend she calls once a week or if she, every time she gets a chance. And man, do they, they love to talk. Well, so somebody comes up and pays Eve some attention, and she, he gets to talking to her. And so she starts listening. And he asks her a very interesting question, a question that, is almost completely right, but makes her start thinking. And so let's see this just a second. In verses 2 and 3, she says plainly to him, The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest she die. She just plainly told him the facts. In verse 4 and 5, he says this, The serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He flat out lies. But he goes on in his lie and, and describes what's going to happen in order to give her uh, a more of a reason to listen to him. She's tempted with evil here. And in 1 John 2, 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And I said he's the prince of this world. And that's exactly the way he starts off with Eve. How does she end up sinning? First of all, it's the lust of the eyes. Let's continue to read. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that was the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, that's the pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her. So she believes the serpent's word over God's. God has told her one thing. She listens to the serpent. He tells her something different. And she's got to make a choice. Now, have you ever seen the cartoons where there's a little angel on this shoulder of this guy and a little devil on this shoulder of this guy? That's about it. I mean, that really is really close, okay? It's not really like that, but you've got a choice to make. And that's what she did. She made a choice to either believe God's word that day or to believe the Satan's word that day. And he was real slick, and she believed Satan over God. And he then she pulls her husband into the same trap, casting really all mankind into sin from birth. Anything that God says, Satan wants to have the opposite. He is his adversary. He is our adversary. He's, he says in a sneaky, smooth way so as to make it very believable. And then once you've agreed with him, he uses it to destroy your relationship with God. And that's exactly what happened with Eve. And so there are some things about Satan I'll point out to you. And this is just half, really. I'm just going to point out a few things to get our idea of what's going on in the world today. 
This person's in this world. He's the prince of the world, first of all. God's allowed him the power to be that. In John 12, 31, I'm not going to ask you to turn to all these. If you want to write them down, you can because we're going to go through a lot of things, okay? He has the power of death, Hebrews 2, 14. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14, he can transform himself into an angel of light. In other words, he can make himself look good. He can make himself look like your best friend. If you were to go and meet I hope you never do. But if you were to meet the devil out on the street, I'm going to tell you something. It's not going to be somebody you would with horns and red face and all that stuff. Not somebody with a, a Hell's Angels jacket on. It's not. It's going to be somebody that's really attractive and smooth and probably has a big smile on their face. He's an angel of light. Um, he has no real power over the born again Christian. 1 John 5:18. He has no real power. Now, he can influence, and I'll talk about that later. In, in Ezekiel 28, you'll find a lot of description about his beauty and his, du his duty and what he does. He has a great deal of beauty about him. His, he was created as one of the most beautiful. Uh, his name means son of the morning. His Lucifer means son of the morning. And he was created in perfect beauty. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 and 17. Most likely... He's, he's the choir director of heaven. I've um, studied a bit. I, I want to do a little more of it. But, but uh, from everything I can get, gather, he was the choir director of heaven. Now cherubims, and he was that anointed cherub. Cherubims protected the holiness of God. Seraphims, they were more about praise. But, that doesn't, but you'll find them together at times. And so I, I have a, an idea that he might be the choir director of heaven. You know, now think about this. This is just food for thought, okay? Who probably went with him when he was cast down? His choir. You know who's going to make up the choir one day? We are when we go to heaven. We're going to be the ones praising God. That's going to be a Good, sweet day. We'll talk about that another day, but it gives me chills. But anyway, we're going to take that place where he left that void. Um, so his pride was his sin. In Isaiah 14, 14, he said this over again. He said, I will, I will, I will, rather than God's will. He said, I will ascend. I will go up. I will. And so that was his, his sin was pride, Isaiah. He tempts and oppresses. He tempts and oppresses. Temptations are Satan using common trials as a means to get you to sin. You know, James chapter 1, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He said, but let patience have your perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So what he's saying is, is this is a part of your life going through these things that makes you a more mature Christian. But he's not saying here that... Um, I'm being tempted. Yay, I'm having fun being tempted. That's not the idea. He said, when you fall into diverse temptations, that word temptation there, and it's important to look these words up, it's not a temptation toward evil necessarily. What it is is a trial that could turn into a temptation toward evil. You see, trials are used by God. And trials, and sometimes trials, you just, this is life. We, we have flat tires, folks. That's just life, right? And, and you can use that as a, um, a, a victory day or you can use that as a um, I, I let Satan have his way and I lost my temper and I blew up and that's a fail day and that's when it became a temptation and you sinned okay trials are used of God to purge us sometimes you know you know what it means to uh, um, when they when they refine gold they heat it up real hot and on the top of that they'll take this screen and they pull off the top of that called the dross. That's the junk. That's the impure parts. And you can't get a more refined and beautiful and pure gold without taking the junk out of it. And sometimes uh, trials that we go through that God allows us to go through, they allow us to be burned a little bit, heated up a little bit, tried by fire so that some of the junk can be uh, dross and pulled off in our life. But you know what? Satan takes those opportunities and he wants to tempt you with it. He wants you to fail at it. He don't want you to pass the test. He wants you to mess up and sin. And so 
He tempts and oppresses. He can oppress a Christian. Oppression is an outside force for a Christian. He cannot possess a Christian. I, I don't have time tonight to go into any further than that, but I'll tell you this. Once a Christian has the Holy Spirit, the spirit of Satan cannot dwell there. And so when he has the Holy Spirit, Satan has no way of overcoming that. He has no match for the Holy Spirit. Um, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, the Bible says. And so uh, you don't have to worry about that, Christian. You cannot be possessed by Satan, but you can be oppressed. And that's the things that go on on the outside. All right? You can be influenced by him. For example, he wrought the misery of Job's life. You remember that? He can cause some bad things in life to happen. He can. He tempted David to number the people. He tempted Christ. He hindered Paul in his work. Um, one of the things he can do in Mark chapter 4, verse 15, he, he snatches the word from people's hearts. In Ephesians 2, 2, he's the prince and the power of the air. He can move about back and forth from the throne of God and back to earth and anywhere he wants. He's the prince and power of the air. He does not live in hell as opposed to what some people think. He probably never goes there. He probably never even wants to darken the doors of it, okay? Because that one day will be his eternal abode. He can transform himself, I said, into angel of light. He fears God, James 4, 7, and he can be resisted. 2 Timothy 2, 26, he sets snares for men. He sets traps for men and women, mankind. So I said, everything that God does, Satan wants to undo or do the opposite of. You have Christ, you have the Antichrist. God created grapes and the ability to make juice. He even gave the ability for a fermentation to happen. And you can have a cleansing alcohol for medicine. Satan uses it as a way to destroy brain cells, people, and families. God creation uh, makes strong medicines to numb pain and things of that nature. Satan uses it to be sold and bought for pleasure, which again destroys brain cells, people, and families. God's creation is used to make weapons for hunting, self-protection, things of that nature. Satan uses them for murder. And this is true for anything, but tonight we're going to talk just a little bit about music. Now, I went through a process of music. There was a time when I knew that the stuff I was listening to was bad for me. And I didn't really know what to do about it. I just knew that... The, First of all, it was a bad philosophy of life. I mean, really? I mean, I listened to a lot of country music. One of the phrases was, there's a tear in my beer because I'm crying for you, dear. You know? Boy, that'll get you going. I mean, that'll uplift you. I mean, I don't know why in the world I listened to that, you know? It was kind of a neat little phrase, I guess. I don't know, but man alive, that'll, that'll really help your life. No, no, you know? Majority of the music just depresses you, you know? Uh, more, majority of it just teaches you philosophy-wise, teaches you to do wrong. But take away the words. I'm not even talking about the words tonight. Not even talking about the words. I'm talking about just the music itself. You know, it, may, it, has, it has a way of making you feel a certain way, right? And, and do a certain thing. And so um, Satan certainly would like to use it. Now, God created music because he created everything at the beginning and everything that's in man. You think about the emotions that man has, gifts that man has, a language, ability to talk, ability to write, ability to draw and do artwork, okay? The ability to create music. It was in man when he created him. Let's think about the logic of this for just a second. If I'm God and you as God and you was thinking, well, I would like to put something in man that he's going to use um, to praise me with. He's going to use it uh, to set his heart and mind into a, a mode of worship. Because worship is not just music. That, that's a whole nother message, but worship is a, is a mind and heart set, your, your focus on the Lord, okay? But uh, we'll talk about that another time. But he's going to use it to praise me with and to set his heart and mind toward worship. And, uh, and it's, going to, it's going to help him. Did you know with David, when he played the harp for Saul, it helped Saul, didn't it? He healed Saul. Matter of, way, matter of fact, he got rid of the evil spirit that was bothering Saul. 
And so music has a wonderful, powerful force. And so think God's thinking logically how he's going to put something in man to do all these things. I'm going to tell you something. If he was going to put a force in there and we call it music, that must be some powerful force, mind it. Because it's going to affect the way you feel, affect the way you think and, and everything. So, so here he does. He creates this powerful force and Satan falls from heaven. He's, mm, of course, probably piping hot, mad at God, okay? for what is going on, and he tries to be everything opposite of what God is. So he's going to develop, create, invent something that can be driven in man to do just the opposite of that, to cause him maybe to worship, but not worship God. Worship something else. Maybe it'll be something that, that man will, will use to, to control him rather than control him towards spiritual things, control him towards unspiritual things. And so Satan creates some other form of music. Music can be perverted. Now, I don't believe that Satan ever created anything. God created everything. But in order for there to sin to come about, okay, what Satan did was is he took something that was already good that God made. He said, how did sin enter the world if you have nothing but good things that God created? Well, Satan takes something good that God created for good and he uses it for evil, okay? All right, let's see. Well, I better not use that. Here we go. Here's a hymn book. That's great. It'll work great. I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. Everybody's hand. Jacob, you're the birthday boy. Come here, boy. I said you hadn't got a spanking today, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here we go. All right. Jacob, is that a good, good book? Yeah, it's a good book. It's a hymn book, right? Is that good? No. Okay, well, what do you mean? It's a good book, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What did I just do? I hit you with it. Was it designed to be hitting you with it? No, that was a wrong use of it, wasn't it? I just perverted the use of this hymn book. You see that? Thank you, Jacob. I'm so sorry. All right. Now. I perverted the use of it. It was created good and for good purposes, good uses. But when I used it the wrong way, I did evil, you see. And that's what Satan has done with the things that God created. God's created beautiful things, wonderful things, powerful things. And Satan will take them and pervert them and use them wrongly. And that's where you find sin and evil. All right. So, I would like to... Um, Talk about music and why is it so important? I think about my own home, my own personal life, and this is the decisions that you're trying to make as well. One of the things that about music is it's everywhere. It is everywhere. It's in your home, of course, um, and I think it's important to have music that honors the Lord in the home because you're going to be constantly bombarded by it everywhere else in life. So have music in your home that honors the Lord and you may have to invest in that. You can get so much free music out there, you know. And, and sometimes it's hard to find good music. It is. There's a lot of junk out there. Uh, but it's hard to find good music. Invest a little time in finding music that will be good for you and your family. Okay? And I have a list of things, places to find it that you can come ask me. Maybe sometime, maybe the next message I'll, I'll share that with you. But... <clears throat> If you don't, the world's music will definitely creep in and it'll, it can consume you, your family. You don't even mean for it to. Um, it comes in on the radio, of course, the TV, of course, not just in some show like MTV or something like that, but in the commercials, in the show that you're watching, in all the movies that you watch. The music is everywhere in there. And I'm not telling you that you can't watch a movie just because it has some questionable music in it. There's certainly a balance there that you've got to strike, but you better balance it back with good music. Most soundtracks are really not appropriate. Most of them are not. So you got to be careful with those uh, movies that you watch. The computer, of course, and your phone. You see it on the phone and everything. But not just in your home, but in the world. You go to the grocery store, they're playing. They pro they're playing music every time I walk in the Kroger. And, um, and I'm like, oh, well, I wish that, why in the world are they play it? You know? I'm like, do you realize what kind of group of people you're really catering to here at Kroger? If you were really smart, you'd probably be playing the oldies. I mean, really. I mean, that's probably. But anyway, 
So, uh, but they don't ever lay the old. But anyway, but it's at Kroger. You know, it's at Walmart. It's in an elevator. It's in the mall. It's outside. When you walk by a store in the mall, that store has its own music blaring, you know, trying to draw you into that store. It drives me nuts. Um, in your restaurant, they say there's some psychology behind it. You'll eat faster and get up from your table and leave or something. I don't know. But, uh, but you're bombarded by it in the restaurant. Just think about it. Everywhere you go, there, there's music. And, um, and so music is everywhere. But also music is powerful. Music is powerful. God's music can appeal to your emotions, make you cry, make you happy. You know, it can inspire you to do something, inspire you to be more holy. It can move you to enter into a, a, a mode of worship and praise to God and, and move you that direction. It can teach you. It can teach you scripture. It can teach you doctrine. Do you know God commanded Moses to teach Israel a song because they continued to fall in sin? And he commanded them to, him to teach them a song because he knew the adage, things remembered in song remembered what? Long. Oh, come on. <laughs> if you remember it in song, you remember it long. All right. And God knew that. Wasn't an old adage, evidently. I must have made it up. All right. So um, it, if you'll remember it if you learn it in song. OK. And so like A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. And everybody's wanting to sing it, aren't they? All right. Yeah. Ba, ba, black sheep. Have you any? Well, same song. <laughs> A twinkle, twinkle, little, same song. Anyway, uh, they use it. It's a good little melody. Well, the kids remember their ABCs with it, don't they? Now, do we, is it like, do you have to know that song to learn your ABCs? No, but if you would go to 99.9% .9 of schools and homeschool parents and Christian schools all over the world, they all know it, okay, because it works. Well, anyway, so um, music is powerful and you can learn something uh, for a long period of time if you learn it in song. That's why those songs that you learned when you was a kid that you wish you didn't know when you was a teenager, you can still remember the lyrics to today. Did you realize how many of you are like, hey, man, I wish I could just get rid of that part of my life. Me, That's me. But anyway, it can convict because it can be the word of God when you sing. Um, it can remind you of a promise you made of God like, I surrender all, I surrender all. And so it can remind you of a promise you made to God. It can move you to desire good things, perfection, sweetness, power, or whatsoever things are lovely, good, perfect, all these things. Satan is the right the opposite, right? It's powerful, but it can be used by Satan too. It's the same power. The rain falls on the just and the unjust. He can take music and he can appeal to your emotions too and your senses, but it'll be destructive. He can inspire you to be destructive. I'm telling you, you'll drive different if you're listening to heavy metal. <laughs> Some of you are like, yeah, I'll go crazy. Okay, but I'm telling you, well, as a teenager, it depended on what kind of music I was listening to. It affected the way I drove. Man, you want to put that pedal to the metal, all right? And you'd hang those curves tight. Okay, but anyway, it can inspire you to be destructive. It can move you to worship self. The world, anything but God. Satan doesn't care what you worship as long as you're not worshiping God. It can teach you worldly philosophy. It can um, make you lose moral control. It's hypnotic. It can move you to desire all the world's philosophy that's sung about. And so now then, that, that's saying a lot. And you say, well, well brother, now I, I don't know about all that that you said about music. Now um, you're going to have to explain that to me and how, how that works out. Um, the, the, the question is, is music amoral? Does it have a morality? Is there a good and a bad music? And you always get this wise guy, you know, that's got to say something about it. And they'll say, all right, kids, let's look at this now. Is music amoral? Well, here we go. You ready? That's middle C. You tell me, is that a good C or is that a bad C? And you're like, you jerk, it's neutral. There's no such thing. Well, then, it's all moral. But I'm afraid it's not as simple as that. And the funny thing is, the only people that, as a wise guy like that, that would walk over the piano and do that, besides me to make fun of that guy, is the Christian 
who believes that music is amoral because it fits for him and takes away the conviction he has that what he's doing is wrong. Because the world has no problem telling you their music's messed up, that their music is wrong. Now, let me give you a couple of illustrations. Is that pencil moral? I mean, is that a good pencil or a bad pencil? Okay. You might say, well, that's, that's, it's, it's neither. It's all moral. You'd be right. It's all moral. What if I wrote the letter A with that pencil? Is that all moral? Yeah, that's all moral too. Nothing wrong with that letter A, is it? What if I add a lot of other letters to it? Is it still all moral? No. Because I can write something there that can be evil. Or I can buy, write something there that can be good. Does that make sense? It's what you create with it. What about that colored crayon? Whatever I draw, whatever I color in, can I color something good? Can I color something bad? Sure you can. Is the color blue or purple, whatever that is. Come on, crayons always have the weirdest. I was going to say they have the weirdest names like pumpernickel, whatever this and other, you know. But you know what it says? Blue. All right, so anyway, <laughs> it's blue. And, and you would say, no, blue is not moral. It's not uh, all moral, I mean. It's, it's just, or wait a minute. It is all moral. It doesn't have a good or a bad, okay? All moral means it doesn't have a good or a bad. And so you'd say, yeah, it's just blue is blue, you know? But if I use that in lots of other colors and I start creating something on a, on a canvas, can I create something vulgar? Sure I can. Same thing with a paintbrush, right? That's a good paintbrush. I can take it and paint, and, and you can see, oh, that's a pretty pitch, color of red. That's a pretty color of red. That's nice, lovely. But I can create something vulgar and profane and grotesque, and I can do something evil with it. I can. Can you write something evil? Sure you can. I've seen some pretty nasty letters. I've seen some nasty cards. I've, I've read some bad things. And you can do evil things with what they can create. Likewise, you can take that art form. Now, that's an art form. That's what God gave man, language, right? Ability to make art, right? It's an art form. So is music. And you can put notes together and rhythms together and chords together in such a way to create something wrong. Now, you say, well, I, don't, I disagree. Then you have the only art form in which that's the case. That doesn't make any logical sense to me at all. But let's not stop there, okay? Let's go just a little bit further. I love this book. It's a big old book. It's all a real impressive, isn't it? All right, anyway, this book is a history, okay? That I don't know how I found it. I found it at a flea market or something. I don't know, but I've held on to it ever since because it's a historical record, really, of rock music and where it came from and stuff, okay? Now, like I said, earlier I said I'm not going to pick on specific genres, but I'll just use rock music because that's what they say and it covers a span of like from eight, well, late 1800s. We started call it rock and roll back in the 1930s, I believe it is, and then all the way to today. I mean, it's just really a big swath. It could be, uh, it could be R&B, it could be um, or heavy metal, it could be rap, it could be pop, alternative. Well, blah blah blah. There's lots of jazz. There's, you know, and um, but they cover. This is this is um, this is not a Christian. Okay, this is not a believer. It's just uh, a man that writes the history of rock and roll. Now, I have lots of books that I've read, Music Matters, Music the Balance, Why I Left the Contemporary Christian Music Movement. That just int intrigued me, so I thought I would read it, and I, I was really amazed. Dan LaCarney wrote, um, and then Kurt Wetzel did one called uh, Is Music All Moral? Uh, I've read some other ones about the morality of music. And there's lots of good books, but those are all Christians. And so I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm a little, just a little skittish of believing every single thing a Christian writes because they're sneaky people. But anyway, so I like this book because it comes straight from an unsaved, as far as I can tell, and a person that just, they're just trying to do the history of rock and roll and they're telling you what it is. And it's funny because the world are the ones that are really honest about it. But the people that are trying their best to get it into the church, they want to hide it from you. Okay, so this is what he says. 
Make no mistake about it, only America, the greatest social laboratory in the history of the planet, could have produced a cultural phenomenon as singularly violent, plaintive, reckless, tender, risky, lurid, threatening, heart-wrenching, grotesque, corruptible, and vital as rock and roll. Boy, those were just positive, uplifting words, weren't they? No, he said it pretty plainly there. I wish I could say he balanced it out with like all the good things that came out of it. He doesn't. It's all bad, okay? Let me just keep going. Rock and roll is the darkness that enshrouds secret desires unfulfilled and the appetite that shoves you forward to disrobe them. Whew. Jerry Lee Lewis has said, he talks a lot about Jerry Lee Lewis, and knows in certain turns that he's going to hell for playing rock and roll. Um... Others raged that setting church music to the rhythms of a barroom or bordello was sacrilege. Um, he made his choice, crossed the line, and began devouring great balls of fire for breakfast, pushing himself to every unholy limit. In New Orleans, Congo Square in the early 1800s, um, slaves were permitted by their masters to congregate in certain days and play their native instruments. And he talks about how these guys, and it's interesting because we just left Memphis. And so I, 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 we were around like the hub of rock and roll and jazz and blues and that sort of thing in Memphis there. And, and some of the reading I've done of the history comes from there in Louisiana. And so they're, what they're trying to do is they're trying to trace it back to like, where did us all come from? Where did rock and roll come from? And, and man, it goes way back. And it talks about the influence that when they brought the slaves over, they allowed them on certain days to congregate and play instruments, native instruments, and use their music. And Shanti, European, uh, Sanglinese people combined their own riveting rhythms with new ones that had bombarded them during their difficult passage in their new surroundings. And he says, this was a scandalous but necessary evil in the opinion of polite society. And I was like, I, don't, I studied the, this a little bit more. I was like, what's the point? Why did he bring that up? I was like, I don't understand why it's that big deal. Well, if you go and you research those tribes that come from Africa, you know what their form of worship was? It was voodoo. And you know what voodoo does with their, with their music? It's mostly drums, and they're calling up evil spirits. It's all about their rhythm and calling up evil spirits. I was like, ah, oh, well, now that makes some sense, doesn't it? But the music that has infected our society is not just from there. It's, it, it comes from other places, Ireland and different places, but that's one that he mentioned. Barriers don't exist in the minds of most gifted rockers. Their thoughts are elsewhere, locked into a feeding frenzy. As it's high-end rock and roll not only eats its young, it eats everything in sight, oblivious to all consequences. It's ironic that to an extent, rock and roll began in church. That's not me saying that. That's what they said. Isn't that interesting? He, um, when Johnny Shines raised his voice as a child in a Memphis chapel, and marveled at the sound of it, realizing there was only one John Ed Shines, and he was never going to come again. And I can't tell you whatever he says after that. But anyway, he uh, started his music in church. Further, one of the first times Jerry Lee Lewis played piano was at the Holiness Church Meeting of God Assembly in Waxahachie. Waxa, Waxahachie. All right. If you want... To get a healthy young man or woman plenty thirsty for something, all you got to do is forbid it. Considerable energy is expended to keep the party going each day. The capability to invoke glorious and grotesque rock and roll vision escalates. Why do they paint it in such a bad light if it's so good? I don't get it, but they do. Any truths in the book emerge organically. Whatever momentum, and this is talking about this book, Whatever momentum that's uh, achieved builds on itself. The process becomes the reward, and it is rich with the energy of living. As the torch is passed and ethos is forged, the conscience is confronted, the truth is felt, and in time, the soul is sold. If it wasn't true, then why do they say it? If it doesn't really have that effect, why would they even bring it up? And I say this because I went through a stage in my life, like I said before, where the, I knew something wasn't right. And I needed to remove some type of music out of my life and put something back in it. But I just, 
I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to do. And so I began to pray that God would allow me to figure this thing out. I was probably 17 or 18 years old. And um, I'm telling you, as I began to pray about it, and I started taking stuff out of my life, and I didn't have anything to put back in it. Man, I felt like a void in my life. If I told you you, were, you weren't allowed to listen to your earbuds or any music at all in your life or in your car or anything for a month, I'm telling you, you'd feel a void in your life. You would, because we like music, right? But man, did I feel empty. I was like, I'm going to get rid of this, God. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get rid of this. I'm going to figure out something. But as I started praying, God started putting things back into my life that I really needed. He started giving me a thirst for it. Now, I compare it to this. How many of you love to play checkers? All right, one or two, three, four, five kids. No adults. Okay, anyway, all right. How many of you love to play chess? Raise your hand. Ooh, I got a lot more hands up that time. To me, it's like this. I enjoyed music on the checkers level when I was younger. But some of it was bad for me. And checkers is bad for you. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's not bad for you. But it's, I'm just trying to compare a little bit. But when I started learning, really learning music, when I started learning God's music and what glorified God, He gave me chess, okay? Isn't, you understand what I mean with chess? It's just so much more deep, right? It's so, it takes, takes so, it's so much more gratifying, too. And man, is it, is it fun. And, but the thing of it is, the music that I enjoy now, it's like I had this cup and it was half full, you know. I mean, God created music for me to enjoy and it was kind of half full. And I didn't know what to do to get it where it needed to be. And God said, throw it out. And I threw it out and I had an empty cup. And I'm like, God, this is not fun. I want a better thing than this. But what he started doing is he started pouring in the good stuff. And he started pouring in the good stuff. And now that cup is full and overflowing. I can't explain to you. I have a five-gallon bucket now of what I used to have. I mean, it's, it, was, it was compared now. If I listen to what I used to now, I'm like, that's so shallow. Why did I ever listen to that? I was like, that's not even entertainment you know, anymore. But anyway, God has just overflowed what he's given me in music. Now, I'm going to go in a little bit more depth to it next time probably. But... I wanted to share with you the way that Satan tries to trip us, the way he tries to deceive us. And I think one of the things that he's done is put a type of music in our worlds that teaches us a wrong philosophy. And, um, and so I hope next week we'll have a little more fun with it. And then Dan's going to follow it up the following week. And so I'm looking forward to that. Well, uh, let me see here. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything off. Well, anyway, that, that's some of the things that the world says about their music. And, and uh, we're going to see next week a little bit more about what God says and how we make those decisions. And we'll look forward to that. I tell you what, let's pray in just a moment. Uh, we'll share more prayer requests that maybe you haven't already shared. Father, thank you so much for your word. And I thank you for this, this study that uh, we've been able to do. I pray that you just help me. As I dig into your word and as I teach, help me to be clear and say nothing more than what you would Holy, Holy Spirit would want me to say. Uh, Lord, I know that it would be uh, a topic like this would be something the devil would just hate for people to really get and understand. I pray that you just help us and protect us. I pray that you'll just bless our church with good music and our homes with good music. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let me um, take a couple of requests from you. And um, I've got a few that's handed to me today, some from the other day, uh, some I want to share with you. So if it's not on that prayer sheet, raise your hand, or if you need to correct something or add something to it, all right? Anything that we need to mention? Okay. Is there any updates to these or praises that we can add? I have a praise. What was it? I had a praise. Oh, I know what it is. Brother William and Hope nicely have uh, got our washer and dryer put in there at the kitchen. I know it may not seem like much to y'all, but boy, is that a big deal to us. And another member of the church here that really has done a lot of laundry lately. <laughs> so it's been, it's been great to uh, see that happen. So they got that finished uh, today. So we praise the Lord for that.
All right. Anything else? Yes. Great. All right. All right. That's Maddie Nicely, Air Force Boot Camp there at the very number one. Okay. A couple of things to add to your list then. If there's anybody else, I'll go ahead and wait for just a second. Anybody else? All right. A couple of things to add to your list. Correct me if I'm wrong, Miss Connie. Ty Dodds, is that his name? Yes. We were going to have a meeting tomorrow morning as well as their safety guy, but he called me today. He's got shingles. So pray for him. And uh, poor fella. He's not in the hospital, but he's still, it's not fun. So pray for him. Okay. I think that's it. Now then, Miss Susan Wolf gave us another request here. Dennis Fink was um, prayed for last year for kidney cancer. The cancer has come back. He has a mass that has wrapped around his artery where the kidney was removed, um, has two spots on his lung. He's started immunotherapy every two weeks and soon will start radiation. And then um, there's a the Jinx family. Brother John gave, uh, Gordon gave me this prayer request. He was in the military with the Jinx uh, family and the granddaughter, Abigail, was training in the military and was killed in a training accident at Fort Bragg. So pray for the Jinx family. And then Crystal Vess is recovering from surgery and uh, has recently lost a spouse. So remember Miss Crystal. All right. And I think that's it besides what is on the prayer list. Is that it? i tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like for us to take a couple of minutes, uh, maybe five minutes just to pray on our own. Uh, I'd like for you to pray for uh, somebody that's either close to you or somebody that's in your family. I understand if you don't want to be next to anybody with COVID and stuff, that's good. Uh, but you pray. I'd like for us to pray for about five minutes with our families or uh, people that are, we're close to. And then I'm going to come back up and close this in prayer. And just do this. Go through that prayer list right there and call people out by name if you will. And um, I, you don't have to be a a uh, beautifully flowery prayer warrior, okay? But God hears those names, and you you think of them on your mind and on your heart as um, as you pray about them, okay? And I'll come up in just a minute and close this in prayer.
Father, we thank you for being here with us tonight. I pray that you be with these that are recovering from surgery. I think about Crystal Vess, and I pray also for the Jinx family that's mourning the loss of Abigail. I pray specifically for these with cancer. I think about Angela Morris and Benny Capp, Cheryl Reynolds, Larry Reeves, Jason Lowe, that six-year-old that's got cancer, and I pray that you just help him, as well as Dennis Finks, the cancer that just came back. Think about these with COPD and uh, Janet, and then um, Laura Ferris's dad, mom, stepmom has got uh, COVID, and I pray that you just help them as they're going through that as well as Judy Simmons that has COVID. Tyler Duff being on ventilator and, and it's already coded twice. Lord, I don't know what's going on there, but I pray that you just help him to come back from that. I pray for Miss Zerny, just continue to help her to recover in her lungs. I pray for Miss Sharon that I believe had surgery today on her hip. I pray that you just help her to recover from that and uh, the physical therapy would go smoothly for her. I pray for this, uh, also this surgery that's coming up for Cheryl Day. And uh, may that go smoothly. I pray that for this little one, we'll attack it, that was burned at Vanderbilt and is at Vanderbilt right now, getting all kinds of treatment. I'm sure that it's a painful thing to go through, and I pray that you be with them. I pray that you bless our church, Lord. I pray that you'll just watch over us and protect us, put a hedge about us and keep us safe from the things that the devil would like to do. I pray that you bless these families as they go back to work this week. Lord, I pray that you give them a great testimony among the people they work with, and I pray that you'll allow them to see victories and, Lord, prayer requests answered this week and encourage them as they go out. I think about Noah Green's family that's, that's uh, lost a loved one. I pray that you just help them. Also, Miss Susan Wolf's um, co-worker's father, Lord, that's not saved. I pray that they would um, be able to talk to him and be able to witness to him more and more. And I pray also and thanks that tomorrow Miss Natalie Ni Natty, Maddie Nicely is graduating from uh, her boot camp. And I pray that you just continue to use her, protect her where she's at and, and deployed. And I pray that you just um, watch over our Military, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us this country and our freedoms that we have. Lord, I pray for those that are in leadership over us, Lord, in a state level and our president. And Lord, I, I know that we can be dis disappointed and unhappy with sometimes the results of the leadership of our country. But Lord, they need you. They need your help. Lord, they need Jesus. They need salvation. And I pray that you... Uh, continue to give us the freedoms that we have here to worship you freely so that we might not only worship freely in our own church, Lord, that we might be able to spread the gospel and share it. Lord, help us to not take it for granted, but share it as we go out into this world in our workplaces, with our families, and we thank you for it. Help everybody to be safe on their way home tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, it's been good to see you tonight. Thank you for coming out. And listen, this Sunday, we'll be studying again in Matthew about why a baby. Why would Jesus and God decide to send his son as a baby? And then I'm going to be continuing the series of Alone with God in our Sunday school lesson. It's for adults, Alone with God. And sometimes you feel like you're alone, but you're really not. And we're going to talk about the Bible characters that... Uh, felt like they were alone at times that we are. And then next week, we're, we're trying our best to put together a kids' class on Wednesday nights. I try to make it a little bit fun for you guys, but, um, but be praying for us, okay, as we start working out details to that, okay? And we'll let you know as soon as we can. All right. Well, God bless you here at Liberty. Have a good night, folks.